Okay, to say that I'm excited about this week's guest in this week's episode, I think is an understatement. <laughs> it's long overdue. Jess Fracolosi, welcome to the Deep Life Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I've been jumping out of my skin to kind of dive deep into all things health and wellness and fitness with you. Um, you know, we've obviously been friends for quite a long time, but for our listeners who don't know who Jess Fracolosi is, can you give us a little bit of a background on who you are and how you became to be this absolutely phenomenal entrepreneur at such a young age with a vision that you just took off and catapulted. I mean, it's an inspiration. So girl, start at the beginning with who Jess is. Oh, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, great. Well, um, let's see. I guess I'll start with kind of my personal background and, and how I grew up and some of the things that I think led to um, the characteristics that sort of have attributed to my wins over the years. Um, and that would be, I guess, that I was in, uh, born into um, military family. My dad uh, joined the Coast Guard at a young age. Um, and so from, from the time I was born, we moved every four years. Um, and I was the youngest of a family of three, I have two older brothers in a military conservative family. Um, I was not babied. And um, I definitely think that uh, having to kind of take being the butt of a lot of jokes and um, sort of not, just just not being babied by two older brothers um, shaped a lot of who I am and my ability to um, to work with men and to kind of put up with um, things that maybe I wouldn't have been able to put up with if I hadn't, you know, been born um, the youngest of, of two older brothers. <laughs> but we moved every four years. And unlike my older brothers, I was very outgoing, um, uh, bubbly, uh, fun loving, let love, love meeting new people and, and learning about people and making friends. So moving was, was a benefit for me. I think that I really, um, gained a lot, whereas I can't say the same necessarily for both of my brothers because they have much different personalities and the moves happened at different points in their lives. We stopped moving when I was in seventh grade. So my dad retired, he, uh, finished up at the Coast Guard Academy in Connecticut. And that's where I, I, we it landed at seventh grade. And so I didn't have to move anymore. I could kind of go through middle school and high school in one place, whereas my brothers had to move in high school. And I think that's a, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, so yeah, we, we were in Connecticut and then I went to um, a middle, middle high school there and then went to college at Northeastern up in Boston. And um, I started college in 2006 and I've been in Boston since then. So what is that? Uh, I, I can't do math. How many years is that? Th 17. 17 years? Yeah. Right? Wow. So 17 I'm years. Fast, I, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I did. Um, I feel like I'm a Bostonian because, you know, I never really stayed in one place until I moved here. So um went to college, wasn't sure what I wanted to be. I, I actually, I take that back. I was always sure what I wanted to be until I changed my mind. Um, <laughs> And then I was very sure that I wanted to be that next thing and um, got a degree in biology. Um, wasn't ready to go back to school, which I thought at the time I wanted to. So I took, took some time off and I accepted a job with an active wear company. Um, a guy that I knew from waiting tables um, at his buddy's restaurant, he hired me to kind of wear yoga clothes, go take yoga classes and get the instructors to wear the gear. And so that is what, um, gave me insight into two paths, into boutique fitness and what was happening in the studio space uh, as compared to the big box gym space. Um, and it also gave me insight into what entrepreneurship was all about because I was one of four in this, in this small company. Um, and about 10 months later, um, I was probably working 60 hour weeks getting paid $20 an hour, um, didn't have equity in the company and had just learned so much and, and butted heads with my boss quite a bit. He was, he really practiced and preached a lot of, um, manufactured urgency, which I don't like at all. Um, mm -hmm. and 
I, like I said, was losing sleep and I didn't even have equity in the company. And I was kind of like, if this guy can do this, then I can do this. And so I quit and um, went back to waiting tables and started really thinking about where the opportunity was in the fitness industry. And at that time, um, at least in boot- in the boutique space, spin um, was taking off in New York City, but was not really in Boston at all yet. And so um, I started building a plan to bring spin spin studio up to Boston. And, um, and yes, yeah. history. <laughs> <is> history, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I have, I, I have really honestly goosebumps listening to you because just from knowing you and knowing, gosh, how we, 15 years, at least we've known each other, if not yeah. longer, um, that whole time in Boston. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And I know the work that you put in. And I remember you working at the spin studio, uh, excuse me, the yoga studio. And then I know the restaurant that you're talking about. So so it's just, it's such an inspiration to hear it because I saw everything behind the scenes. And I think that that's what a lot of people miss. And what I really want to get into in this podcast, because you've built this brand, this really this empire that's taking off right now, but it took a while. It took a lot of dedication and you were working your butt off to get you to this point. And now you're getting the recognition that you absolutely deserve. Not that you didn't before, but it's taken a lot. I mean, this has been your life. You've cultivated this to be a part of who you are and you want to pass that on. And I think that that's such an amazing attribute because you're not just in the boutique fitness space anymore. You are branching out a little bit, which we'll get more into. later down in the, in the podcast, but you know, you started to, to touch upon it, but yes, if you didn't already, like, let's, let's jump into the handlebar and how it, you know, it started Mm -hmm. because correct me if I'm wrong. Are we eight locations now? Are you eight locations? We're eight locations. Yes. I mean, oh my gosh. I remember, wait, Dan and I have got to say this. I remember the first weekend that you opened the handlebar back in 2013 Yes. Which is crazy that we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary, Jess. I know. I know. How fitting is this? (laughs) (laughs) But I remember, I think it was like friends and family weekend. It was like a soft opening. You were the instructor. Dan and I were like one of like a handful of people in the studio in Back Bay in the South, uh, South Bay, South Bay, South 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 Boston, first location. And I just was like, it was so fascinating to, to watch you. So like, let's dive into the handlebar and, you know, what made you kind of choose spin? Obviously you said it was booming in New York and, you know, Boston's right behind there. So, so let's get into that. Okay. And I'm like, I took, I have a bunch of notes of things that I wanted to talk about and how my, the handlebar and my relationship with the handlebar has, has molded and impacted who I am and molded and impacted where my family is. And yeah you know, you, you're, you're flattering me and, and I appreciate that so much. Um, you know, and I, but I hope that some of the more, you know, the details about what it has meant, you know, it's not, um, it's not, it's certainly not all roses and butterflies. Absolutely. We can get into it. Definitely. Let's, that's why we say the deep life, because it, we paint a very, especially with social media. That's what I was saying. We paint a very, you know, structured picture of everything is good. Like your 10 years, like this is who I am and this empire, but it's like, no man, we've been through a lot and it has not been easy to get, right. get to where we are, where you are. So yes, let get, get into that. Be, be vulnerably honest. That's what this is about. Yeah. And I definitely, especially on this podcast with the two of you want to be honest because, um, so many times I'm brought onto podcasts, like, and not, not a lot, I'm not on a ton of podcasts, but because of the handlebar and it's sort of a PR thing. And so I have that lens of let's protect the sanctity of the business and make sure that it sounds good and, and pump up all of the good things. And as, and as much as a lot of that is valid and true, I want to definitely be a little bit more real with you guys. Yeah, Um, let's do it. Um, so, all right. Where do I even begin? Um, I think one of the first uh, key points about how the business got started and the, the shape that it took over the years was the fact that I got investors. Um, and I didn't do kind of a friends and family loan. I didn't do a small business loan. I, I went and found angel investors. Mm-hmm. And so, um, 
that was the first, the first year was, was the built business plan and the fundraising. Um, and it took a full year, really probably a full year after the business plan was kind of drafted to then get the money. And then the next six months was like finding the first location, but the group of people that I found, it was one person at a time. It was a group of males. Um, at the time they were in their mid to late twenties, um, working for Goldman Sachs and then connected me one at a time to different people in their network. And I ended up with a group of five guys um, who each contributed to the initial investment. Um, they were all sort of in this same New York or Chicago scene, finance, um, you know, doing very well for themselves. And this was a kind of a pet project that they were happy to get some skin in the game because they too saw what was happening in the fitness industry. But none of them were... Um, interested in operating the business. They needed an operating partner. And so that was me. Um, and, you know, early on bringing on that money meant a, a lot of things. It meant that I didn't have debt out of the gate, which was cool. It meant that I had people on my team who were really smart in terms of finance and accounting and how to deal with the money. And, that, um, and they knew what in investors, future investors, landlords, we're going to want to know and hear. So I got a lot of really valuable um, advice that, you know, in the early, in the early months and years. Um, but it also meant that um, there were people in a, the pieces of the pie that were going to want more eventually. Yeah. And um, it wasn't just me making the decisions when it came to ambition. There were others who, you know, would would benefit if we continued to grow. And so um, definitely for better through, I would say, March of 2020 was the fact that I had these investors and they could kind of look at the numbers and say, we're in a stable place. Let's think about the next location. Because mm -hmm. if it was just me, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to see the forest through the trees. And I would have been a little overwhelmed by all of the operations and the people and um, competition. And, and I wouldn't be able to just look at the numbers and say, yeah, we are doing good. I'd probably be like, no, it's too much. I need to just focus on what we have. Um, so, so we drove forward very quickly early on. So South Boston opened 2013 fall uh, or summer and by September or November, we were like cash flow positive. Like we were kind of making enough money to cover everything. Um, which is incredible, mm -hmm. which is incredible. I mean, that is, yeah. Again, like, I'm not like your hype person. I mean, it just, it, it is incredible. <laughs> and I will say, so a lot of that was luck, you know, location yeah, number two, um, uh, location number two was Fenway. And if that had been location number one, I don't know that we would have ever opened a second to be honest, mm. because that studio took three years to ramp up to profitable. Wow. Um, so okay. South Boston being number one gave us this confidence because it was like a home run just out of the yeah. gate, it just pretty much largely because of location. Um, I, I mean, was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah Selfie at that timing. time was, yeah. was kind of like, everybody's like, okay, South Boston is cool now. And it's just, yeah. yeah so exactly. It super expensive yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? I'm assuming. Um, so, so yeah, so we quickly moved on to opening the second um, and the second one wasn't as easy, but I was managing and as the business was still overall profitable because South Boston continued to grow and do well enough so that we went on to open the third one, even before the second one was profitable because it was trending in the right direction. Market conditions were good. Um, and so that was by 2015 when we opened the Harvard square studio. So, so summer of 2015, I had three studios. Um, that same summer is when my dad uh, got diagnosed with cancer. Um, and over the next two years, three years, um, it was just a matter of like, kind of like adjusting my perspective on the business and just life and existence and all of the, all of the challenge and pain that comes along with sickness and death. Um, and yeah, I took these notes that like, that was like that first phase from 2012 to 2016, really handlebar was my clubhouse. It was, 
I was designing events and initiatives that were for the target audience, which was me. And yeah. I could enjoy it to the fullest. I was single, mid twenties, not single. I had a boyfriend, but you know what I mean? Not, not yeah. married, didn't have kids, um, um, was making enough money to enjoy, um, you know, boutique fitness classes, me and my, our, all of our customer base. Um, and so I fit right in and so did the employees. And we were, I was hiring friends. My employees were becoming my friends. It was very much kind of, we were thick as thieves, just this little te- empire kind of growing. We were doing it together and life was good. Life was easy. Yeah. Um, and then my dad getting sick kind of t- turned this new corner in, in, um, our decade history where, um, the business and my perspective, and I don't have to dive into, we can talk about my perspective towards the business later. I'll kind of move through the history and then we can come back to that. But so took some time to solidify a three location operation, which is much different than a single location. Hmm. Um, and the growing pains that come along with that, not being able to be in two places, three places at once, the identity pains associated with like, entering one of my studios and a staff member saying like, Oh, what are you doing here? And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. That'll, never, that'll never get easy. That happens. <laughs> every, every day. And I'm like, well, you know, I guess I, I, I guess I belong here. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, feeling like, um, the handlebar was bigger than me, you know? Wow. And, um, and so then let's see from there, the next kind of chapter was, um, my, my dad passed, um, and Sean and I decided to have, have a child and, um, and we also decided to open a fourth location. It had been like four years. We had, we felt like, okay, let's do it. Business is really, really good. We're ready to kind of open another one. So that all sort of happened at the same time. Um, I got pregnant. Um, we were moving through this. I decided, with the recommendation of my partners that we should buy out a couple of our other partners. So, um, we took on, um, some, some business debt to do a a leveraged buyout so that I could have more ownership. These other guys could have more ownership. And, and at that same time, we took out some, some money to open this fourth location Hmm. and it was scary. And I wasn't, I was like, is, are we sure this is okay? And everybody was like, your cash flow is X you can, debt is good debt if you can support it. Okay, and, yeah. um, you know, the advice was sound that this is, you know, your business is in a place to take this on. So we did, and we did this buyout and got rid of a couple people. I had more ownership and we opened, we, we had the money to open this new location. Um, I'll, I'll never forget. I, I closed on the, the, those loans during my maternity leave, which <laughs> it wasn't an exist. It wasn't a thing. I yeah. was, breastfeeding on the couch while I was taking calls with bank of America. Um, oh my gosh. but, um, Oscar was born and we had decided that Sean was going to leave his job and Sean came and joined me so that we could kind of manage it all, manage the business together, manage parenthood together mm-hmm. and, um, and kind of start this brave new world as a family. Um, then, I mean, and again, I want to go back and talk about all this and how it affected me personally, but like, absolutely that was soon after a few months, it wasn't going to work. And it was like, our world was upside down. We have this new child. We're trying to work together. You know, business was, was great, but it was busy. And I was having an identity crisis of mom and entrepreneur and, Mm -hmm. you know, have this new debt with the company. And my husband now works for me. And it all kind of blew up into the fact that like, we need our marriages first and foremost. We've got to protect that. Like we, we, we can't keep doing this. So at the time we didn't need any um, more income because the business was just doing so well. So it wasn't a rush for Sean to go out and find a job. So he was able to take some time and explore himself and do some creative endeavors. Um, it was, it was a hard, he went through a hard time and, it, and I take a lot of responsibility for that. I'm the one who pushed him to, to leave his job and come join me. Um, mm-hmm. Then let's see, then kind of the pandemic hit. We we bought this house, um, uh, February of 2020. Um, and like I said, we are doing very well and, um, we mapped out all the renovations that were going to happen and, um, and moved up here and 
COVID um, happened in March of 2020. So that had been our busiest year ever um, that winter. And wow. then, yeah, then the rug was pulled out from under us and, um, and everything got really, really, really hard. And, um, <laughs> and we are still sort of in that phase while the pandemic is behind us, sort of, we're definitely still in this recovery mode and the business has transformed so much. Um, but let's see last couple of things about, I guess, shape and size of the business pandemic hit. We did a bunch of things. We got really creative. We had offsite classes outdoors in a nightclub. We did on, we did virtual, you know, um, just any way and every way to make money. And, um, I, the business, as I mentioned, was made up of a lot of my friends and I had yeah. sunk and continue, you know, to, over the years to have just put all my all into the business. It really, it's who I am. It's, it's who I surround myself with. And, um, for better or worse, I lost touch with a lot of like, you know, I didn't have friends outside of the business. I, my family, my closest family, I maintained my relationships with, but like I was, my life was in Boston, in the studios. And when the pandemic hit, I started seeing attrition of the folks who had been there um, from the beginning and couldn't kind of handle the pain associated with the possible loss of the business, the stress of, um, you know, having to do pay cuts and not the uncertainty of what's to come. So there was a lot of turnover and it got to the point um, at, one, at one place in the pandemic where I had lost like um, three key employees over the course of six months. And it was literally just me. And wow. it just, we had decided aggressively to open a fifth location during the pandemic because we got this awesome opportunity. Um, kind of an instance of ambition, getting the best of me. Um, mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> we had just opened a fifth location and I was at a place where I had like essentially no full-time employees almost. Um, wow. And I was, everything fell on my shoulders and that was like the lowest of the low, but it opened my eyes to what I needed, which was partners, operating partners with skin in the game. You know, my original investors could do absolutely nothing to help me. Um, you know, they are working their jobs in New York and San Francisco and, you know, the best they could do was give, give us advice on how to navigate, you know, government resources and things like that. But in terms of actually who's going to, who's going to fix the things in the studio, who's going to staff the classes, who's going to train our instructors, who's going to do the marketing. It was all on me. And, um, and that's when I started pursuing partners by way of some sort of either acquisition or merger, because mm. I just needed I needed folks around me that had skin in the game. And so um, that was 2021, that conversation started. Um, and then we just closed in November of 2022 on a merger with one of our competitors. And um, so that's how we went from five to eight locations yes. um, was that uh, we merged with Turnstile and three of their locations turned into handlebars. And now I have uh, three new business partners who are working full-time with me in the company. Um, so just, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, there is so much to unpack there. It's it, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. Right. Right. I don't want to speak for you whatsoever, but it sounds like everything happens for a reason. I mean, we're, we're super into that in, in our kind of mm -hmm. spirituality, <laughs> um, but it's like, it's almost, it's just so amazing to see this evolution of the brand and how it's evolved over this decade long time, because I'm sure that when you kind of began the handlebar and had this vision that you took in your entrepreneurial spirit, it's probably a lot different than what you had envisioned it originally. But as, you know, as we mature, you know, you're not 24 anymore. You know, we're also, so as, as we grow and get older, I feel like what we learn in the world does shape kind of how we show up both, you know, within our workforce, our career and like as family, and then when tragedy hits. So I do kind of want to touch upon a couple of things that you had mentioned to go back to it, like full circle with your dad and then Sean bringing him into the business. Cause I do think it's really interesting because now Dan and I work together, even though we're kind of like branching off a little bit of, of working together too. Um, so I feel like it's just as we grow, 
so do the things in our life and not necessarily in a bad way. Um, but like, let's circle back to kind of the role that spin and the handlebar and fitness had in your life around your dad's passing and, and how that affected you because you were very close to your father. This happened really suddenly and like talk a little bit about how that impacted you and if anything shape shifted your mind and perspective about life and like if there were any different changes that were that came into yourself pertaining to the business and then as a family too because you were obviously with Sean at this time but you hadn't had Oscar yet. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so, and you can go and, and, and it, 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 feel free to say, no, this is too personal, or I don't want to get no. too deep into it. It, 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 it. We'll, 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 we'll go with what you want here. <laughs> um, and I realized like, I just spoke for probably 20 minutes about my timeline. It's like, I feel like I always do that. There's so no, much. I, no, that's, that's what great. we need. We need that. No, that's, that's mm-hmm. it. It clearly lays out this 10 year period in 20 minutes. I mean, that's nothing compared to, no, yeah, I think that it, it gives a great timeline over everything that's happened. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean, the handlebar and the, the classes and the experience and the people, um, were, were critical for me during my dad's illness and passing. Um, I mean, when I got the phone call that he had had a seizure, I was at a handlebar event on Northeastern's campus. Um, it was big, big dog 5k. And, um, we were, we had like a little booth set up and yeah, I got the call and, um, I, I started crying and I was shaken up and then, um, I kind of had to pull it together and the show must go on at work. And I could kind of lose myself in the energy of the people around me and the music and, you know, just sweating and, and all of the things that come along with it. And I feel like that's kind of a snapshot of what it was. It was like, it was, um, it was an escape and, um, but a healthy one, you know, um, to be able yeah. to lean on that. And, and, and any fitness instructor or coach can probably attest that like, you can't bring yourself into your client's session. Like you have to show up for your client. And I mean, you bring yourself into some extent, but like the, the things that are just straight downers, you've got to leave at the door. And, um, and sometimes, that's helpful to fake it till you make it and just put the smile on and say that and embrace the positive mantras and, um, kind of live what you preach. Um, so in that sense, the handlebar was, was a healthy distraction for me while my dad was sick. Um, but my dad, uh, I, I would say that like my dad's, strengths and words of wisdom and impact on me didn't really resonate or take hold until after he died. Um, and I almost feel, and I know people who've lost loved ones often say the same thing that like their value to your essence and who you are kind of becomes gross as time goes on. Cause you yeah. just, you, you've got these memories and you learn things about yourself as time goes on that you can then connect to them. Whereas when they're in your life and you're talking to them on the phone on a regular basis, you get kind of lost in the what's right here right now yeah. versus um, when that conversation goes quiet, it's it's remembering who they were and what they stood for and um, allowing that to um, to sink in. So that is one one benefit to loss, I think, is to be able to have a deeper understanding of somebody's um, impact on your life. But um, my dad always preached quality and heart and doing good work and 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 it, we're doing things with intention and not half-assing anything and um, you know just kind of one foot in front of the other. And I always he always used Winston Churchill quotes and there'd be times that I would be overwhelmed with stress at the handlebar and he would tell me something like you know a Winston Churchill quote, like the only, the only way out of hell is through it. 
Yeah. And, uh, and those words really came to me during the pandemic, you know, like a lot of, a lot of my dad's teachings, um, and just discipline, um, and his, he didn't care for flashy things. He didn't care for, um, you know, what was cool or just kind of an eye roll when, when I would, yeah. the things that mattered to me as a young 20 something girl, um, yeah. to him were a little bit kind of silly. And those, that's, I was able to take that as I got older. Um, so I love that. I think it's, it's, it seems like I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but it seems like it was simplistic, but so profound in what he left with you and those little nuggets, those quotes, the things that, you know, are just going to get you through day by day is honestly what's most important because, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always looking to the future, especially like from ourselves, but always the outside people, you know, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Yeah. And like, I get it. You, you have to maybe have some sort of goal so that can manifest in your reality. But the only moment we have is now. Right. right. The only moment, this is the present moment. So as long as I can put those thoughts and feelings and emotions into what I want in the next five years, that's all that matters. But it's like the here moment now. And I love that that was like such a simplistic message that, you know what? You needed that voice to get you through gosh, the virus is yeah. <laughs> like shaking the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, like you said, though, my dad's passing also was my first real, I'd always known about presence and mindfulness. My brother always preached it, but I kind of didn't really fully get it. But yeah. when my dad was sick at the, at the end in the last few months, he actually lost his ability to speak. Um, but mentally he was still kind of there. So you can imagine how agonizing like that, that must've been for him. Yeah. And, um, and I just know that, that the kind of the depth of the present moment really took light at that point in my life. Um, and so that was a transformative moment. Um, wow. and then let's see. Oh, and then, yeah. So the next chapter was kind of Oscar, um, and yeah. the pregnancy and, um, and I and mean, this in and of itself is really interesting because I feel like right now, especially with this kind of feminine aspect of the universe that we're trying to move towards, as opposed to kind of like, we've been grind, 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 go, go, go the masculine energy, which we, we honestly need a balance of both. Like you can't have too much masculine. You can't have too much feminine. It's really uh, balancing them out. But I'm speaking more in terms of, you know, women who just, you know, they want it all. They want to work. They want to have a career, a family, entrepreneur, whatever it may be. I mean, you do it again from the outside so gracefully. Um, but I want to get into the nitty gritty of it because I can only imagine how that was because you had Oscar right also before the pandemic too, which I can only imagine um, added a very interesting kind of twist. Yes. And, um, you know, like I, I made mention to Sean coming on board and then us deciding yes. that, that that wasn't going to work and him not, you know, him taking time off from the workforce um, what, and then the pandemic hit hmm. and then the uncertainties of the future and the fact that we have continue to have a pretty large business debt yeah. sitting on us, on our assets. Um, that was no joke. And the societal, um, the societal pressure, I guess, or just structure that, um, is drawn out for us to live within was, um, essentially impossible for me to live within, um, because I was the primary breadwinner. Um, I was, I, I, I have a very deep maternal instinct. I have no interest in, um, I never did have an interest in outsourcing all my childcare. Like mm -hmm. even when Sean wasn't working, I didn't want him to be the stay at home dad like that. Neither of us wanted that. He doesn't want that for himself. And I didn't want that for myself. Um, and not, not that there's anything wrong with that at all. Um, sure. but the, these things like 
then then this this business, which was very much at risk and me having to keep it alive yeah. while trying to do all of these other things. I mean, I somehow got through that um, period and yeah. Sean, Sean did as well. And he now is two years into a new career path and he wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the time that he took. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think as tragic and crazy as the pandemic was, I do think like if there's a silver lining, it allowed people to really realize a lot of the BS that was going mm. on kind of in yeah. the government and corporate structures that just collapsed. And also, like you were saying, the societal pressure to conform to like what people think success is, which yeah. is defined differently from every person anyways. So it's, <laughs> I just love that you have carved your own mm-hmm. path in a sense where you're like, F this, I'm not going with what everybody's telling me to do. Because first off, they're all going in one direction. It's not always the right direction. You kind of need to go Mm -hmm. left instead of going right anyways. Yeah. It's so cool too to like, look look back, like as you're kind of laying out this timeline and even like your your youth coming into this, this handlebar timeline. It's so interesting how with a little bit of perspective, you can look back and everything makes sense. Where it's like you needed to move around as a child to learn how to yeah. communicate and meet new people and put yourself out there. You needed the structure of your upbringing. You needed to have brother, like all these yes. pieces fit together. Then you ended up in Connecticut and in New England and at Northeastern and all these places where it just fit together so perfectly. Yeah. And I wanted to ask kind of, because you said maybe, um, may, well, actually let's say when you were starting, like 2012, 2013, I'll say nothing against you. And I thought you were crazy, like <laughs> trying to start, start this business. I'm like, what the hell is a spin class? Like, <laughs> it, but it, it, it says more about me because I it took me another 10 years to realize, oh, I need to go start something for myself. I can't just work for people. And you got it at a young age, yeah. probably, you know, because of your upbringing, because of just the person that you are. Was your vision to have like one studio where I know you said maybe you would have been a little more content with just like a good, successful studio. And then yeah. like, because you had other stakeholders, yeah, you were kind of forced into building more of an empire. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, was it, or was yeah, the vision it, always to have like a spin empire? No. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's very accurate. I think the, the problem was that I didn't have a 10 year plan. I was like, this feels doable and I see what it takes to do this. So I'm gonna move forward. But 24 year old me didn't think about the exit strategy. I didn't think about what does this look like on the other side? Everything to that point in my life, I had been able to try and succeed and decide, try and succeed and decide, is this what I want? Do I want to build off this or do I want to move on from this? And what the handlebar dealt me was try and succeed and you are bound to this thing. And you must continue. And and so in some ways, I do think, and a lot of the kind words that you said at the beginning, Elise, about like how much I have built and like all of this work behind me, like there's the same amount of hours in the day for everybody, but I'm lucky enough that for the past 12 years, my time and my day has gone towards the same thing. Whereas Mm -hmm. if I hadn't been bound to this thing, whether it be via investors, via leases, via this debt, like I think my personality, my novelty seeking like part parts of me, um, I would have, I would have twisted and turned and jumped career paths and tried a bunch of different things. And I would have had this body of work that would have been much more disjointed. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that was, it's like, luck but there's pain associated with it and and this feeling of imprisonment associated with it but it has allowed for um a body of work you know absolutely that's so powerful that it's so cool how that how those things kind of happen where it that it's just what your path is and it's right all the lessons that you've needed have sort of been there whether they seemed like they were for you at the time or not yeah everything you've needed is kind of worked its way out in a sense yeah and um you know it's it's uh it's 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 incredibly it's incredibly stressful it continues to be incredibly stressful and the weight of that stress day in day out um 
I've, I've attempted to manage and wrangle and, and decrease and in many ways through largely my number one mode is escape, right. Is like shut it off either by smoking weed or, um, you know, engaging in thought patterns that are an escape. Um, and now 10 years in, um, and kind of this brave new world post pandemic where no, we don't have the uncertainty of the virus and whether we're going to get shut down, at least not right now, but we do have this like behemoth business that is vulnerable and it's not stable. It's not, it's not always profitable. Each location in itself is not profitable. There are a myriad of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, and so it's like forming this new relationship with this thing. And, um, I've, I'm here because of success, right? I got here because of success, but success has landed me in a place where I often feel like a victim. And I, and wow. even those closest to me know and kind of treat me as such that I am sort of victim to this massive thing that I am not responsible for. And there's nothing, there's nowhere for me to go. Like I have to take it where it needs, I have to take it to stability. And so we're on our way, right? I kind of see the path, but things are always changing. Um, but I think one thing that this is like my, crucible is like a very dramatic word, but like, I, this is, this is my burden to bear. And there's, I, I, I try to remind myself when I feel too much like a victim of like the fact that I was able to get here is so much because of privilege and because of what I was born with. And I avoided so much pain early on in life because of the things I was born with, the way I look, the, my personality type, and, um, my education, you know, and like, th- like those things afforded me yeses. Yes, yes, yes. You can do this. Yes. I want to work with you. Yes. I want to do this. Um, and so those yeses built this thing around me that I now have to carry. And yeah. so, um, when I do kind of feel like a victim, I just remind myself that like every struggle is unique, but no, every struggle, um, it's all relative, right? Some other you know, young woman's inability to find a job or, or find a relationship or, you know, that pain and that burden is just as big to bear as the one that I have carrying, you know, this successful empire um, or what have you. So I don't know, it all comes back to like how, how equal we all are, right. And how our existence is just so intertwined and, um, especially when you stop to just breathe in the moment that, um, we're, we're a pulse, you know, we're, we're, we're the air in our lungs and, and that's enough. We just kind of continue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's such a beautiful way to put it. And it's like every, like the, the worst thing that happens to any of us is, is the worst thing that happens to us. So like, you can't really judge somebody else's burden. Yes. Like that same, that same person that you're talking about, who's maybe struggling to get a job or struggling to find a relationship are in the exact same position you would be if you had had their DNA and their upbringing and their life experiences. Right. Same way that like, if I, if I were you, I'd be in your position, but it's all just a different perspective of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think the way you put it was so. Yeah. And I love that you have this perspective of it because we all are connected and like us as humans are all one. We're all, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we're all first off, we're all just trying our best. Yeah. Um, Which I think is simple, but complex at the same time. And I want to know, you know, through this whole, you know, decade long handlebar excursion, but like even further than that and kind of like to present day, you know, how would you say, like, has your relationship with fitness kind of stayed the same or change, you know, being in the boutique kind of fitness aspect as opposed to like the big box gyms, like kind of talk about that a little bit. We, let's, let's kind of get into that. Mm. Cause I do want to, cause Dan was in big box gyms, which is complete opposite from like this boutique. Com- it's really a community 
that you have cultivated, mm-hmm. which is so different than the grind that yeah. Dan was in. So I've seen him, but then I've seen yours. So let's talk about kind of like the difference and kind of your relationship to fitness now, as opposed to what it was when you first started the spin studio. Yeah. Um, I oftentimes feel like a fraud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the fitness side of things, because I, I, I have always enjoyed working out, but I've never had like an expanded like relationship with fitness. Like I, I, I don't I know. know. What you, mean. you know what yeah, I mean? I feel, like, I feel the same way because if we're talking about like Dan and Sean, who like grew up playing football, like at a high division one level, and they, they were playing it for years since they were little people and they've lifted weights for 20 something years. And I, I feel very much the same way. I feel very much like, I don't know what I'm talking about. Like I am newer into the health and wellness space than him. So I think like, I, un, I very much understand what you're saying. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but yes, like I've never truly like set and achieved fitness goals. Yeah. <laughs> it's never, I've never set out to, um, you know, lose weight by way of X, Y, Z plan or build. There was a little period during COVID where I was hitting, where I was lifting and, um, that was, that was great. And that was fun. But, um, I think that for the most part, um, for me, it's been about fitness has played into just my overall balance and it has been just as much mental as it, as it is physical. It's about like, it's about, getting in there enough to stay balanced. And it's sort of my approach or my, what my approach has been and what I'm really trying hard. And I'm starting to see a shift is I I almost have had always used fitness as like a defense to to fend off the stressors of the world is like, it's there for me to just go. And like I said, just do enough to keep the devil at bay, you know? And now I'm starting to think about fitness and nutrition and mindfulness, um, as a, as a tool for, um, for enjoyment, pleasure, Mm self-care. And, um, it's still very challenging, but when I get tastes of it, I know that that's what I want for myself. (laughs) This is, that sounds bad. I sound like I, I, because it's like, I need to be able to create the space and the time to focus on me, but that really has not happened in the past 10 years. Like that has been like, I just, I get in there and I do it either because I'm teaching a class or because I need to get to somebody's class. Cause I haven't seen them in a while. Like the actual fitness piece ends up for me at the handlebar ends up being a lot more social. Like I teach the class or I take the class because I, because it's like expected of me to engage with the employees in the community versus it being, um, I don't know, like an outbound effort for me to stay well or to be well or to reach goals. Um, but I'm shifting that and I want to take control. I'm in the process of taking control of my health and wellness and, um, using, and part of that right now is I'm in this sort of like walls up, I'm really not going into the city a lot because I'm trying to sort of find my, to root myself in wellness here. And when I go into the city, it becomes social, it becomes expectations. It becomes, what do you have to say, Jess, what's going on here? Like this, this sort of, um, complex thing that doesn't drive any goals forward. So sort of taking some time away so that I can find my wellness plan and build my wellness plan in a sustainable way that works for the long term. And then kind of like, then I'll uncover what the handlebar, what, what place it takes in my life. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm kind of, that was a long roundabout way of telling. No, yeah, I think it absolutely does. It 100% makes sense. And I, I mean, you're talking to us, which again, you know, but I feel like almost like what you're doing right now, kind of like in this almost like growth bubble of your own Mm -hmm. is like what Dan and I did in LA. Yeah. So it took us Mm -hmm. legit eight years in LA without anyone near us. I mean, you know, we, we had to move across the country to find out who we, who we were without everybody telling us who to be. Yeah. And that's like where we tried to find ourselves. Like I, 
I mean, I've been through a plethora of jobs because I've gone through everything that I don't want to do, but it's like, at least those have taught me what I don't want to do. And now I have much more of a clearer vision, what I do want to do, but I had, you, you almost have to tune out the noise. Yeah. So yeah. Like that correlates to the city. It's the same thing. I mean, I miss, I miss living in a city so much, but then when I'm in the suburbs, it's like, peace and quiet. It's like, I can hear my own thoughts and my thoughts are my teacher. Like I have to listen to the voice in my head, Mm -hmm. whether it be good or bad, because most of the time it's bad, but those are still teaching me. Like Mm -hmm. I have these bad thoughts, these reoccurring, you know, anxieties and stressors. But if I keep pushing them down and down and down, they're not going anywhere. I have to be able to deal with them and release them. And then whatever version of myself comes from those thoughts that I've worked through and integrated is going to be the next version of me. And I think that that's kind of where you're on this like amazing cusp. Yeah. Of yeah. You figured out like, all right, I've been in this for a decade now. I've changed so much. My life has changed so much with my husband and my child and, you know, a post pandemic, like you're almost like in this identity crisis now. Yeah. Like, well, but it's like exciting to see like what's going to happen next? Because it's like, you can almost work off a blank slate. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I can, I now, um, and, and it was, it was a path that, that I had started right before COVID by, by us moving up here. It was creating that physical distance so that we could, you know, I could, I could figure out who I was and what the handlebar was in relation to me, rather than being inside of this sphere or this, like, that's constantly pulling me in, create that physical distance. Um, the pandemic was a hiccup, right? It pulled me right back in. I longer commute, but I had to be in there. Um, and just all of this plethora of new challenges that it brought with it. And now I am now that the merger is done and closed and we're like four months into it, there's still a lot, but I do have this hope that um, I can kind of pick up where I left off, which was, which was putting the handlebar in this very healthy box that I'm able to lift the lid on and close the lid on, um, you know, as I need to, uh, to, to care for myself because a balanced me and um, a creative me and a, and a, and a active me and and involved me with my friends and my family outside of the handlebar is a me that has clarity. And that's the person that's really going to make the best decisions for this beautiful entity that lives in this box, you know? So that's what I'm the way that I'm trying to get back to. I love that. That is is great. When you, so when you're talking about fitness as you were originally like trying to push trying to push things off and whether it's like therapeutic or it's health and like pushing off disease or pushing off, you know, body weight or whatever it is. Is that like, is that what you see in the sort of 